right? Did you ever, did you already get any couples marrying? Oh that? God, yeah. So Hello yeah. everyone. This is yet another episode of Career Talks. And today uh, I have great pleasure to introduce John Uke. Uh, John Uke is an entrepreneur helping gamers uh, find their soulmates in the crowd. But he is also interested in uh, psychometry and psychology and now working on a very cool pro project called uh, 512 Personalities, where he works on a novel method using science to better understand human personality and describe its multidimensional nature. John developed uh, Game3, an app for gamers that helps uh, almost half a million gamers call the, find their new friends and favorite games to play with. Um, this next level curation is provided by uh, AI, analysis of your personal tastes, values, and psychology. Thank you so much, uh, John, for joining us today. Uh, great to have you. And I like to, thank you so much. And I'd like to ask you first a few questions about your uh, story, because it's quite a long story uh, of yourself moving all the way to California and doing what you're doing today with Game Tree. And you're also, I know, uh, of, of your um, efforts in the field of psychometry. So, so I'd like to hear the back, background story. Okay, so I originally I got into personality psychology as sort of a hobby. Um, almost everybody comes in because they want to know themselves better. And that's where like 90% of people leave. Uh, for me, uh, I am like a very logical person and it helped me understand people better, having a framework and also being like less in tune with emotions and being able to just kind of understand how people are acting emotionally. Uh, and then I went way deeper because I started Game Tree, which is uh, currently the top ranked app for gamers to find friends. And so there's like hundreds of thousands of people using it, meeting people. And um, the reason it's well ranked is because of applying personality psychology as well as tons and tons of other deep curation on a level that nobody else in the world that I've seen is doing to match people. And so the personality psychology is useful for helping design algorithms and such. Um, I actually moved from California to Ukraine to build that startup because living in San Francisco, everything's expensive. It's hard to hire people. It's expensive to live. Getting customers and getting product market fit is expensive. So everything was better in Ukraine. And so that worked and helped get the company off the ground. But then suddenly Russia invades and now I'm back in California. What? Ontology of value, we help professionals with developing their potential, building value and navigating towards their dream careers. We offer intensive career orientation courses, combining self-discovery with practical information about the job market. We also work on our own educational materials such as books and self-navigation manuals. Our new tool, the Deontology of Value Test, will help you discover what your natural way of creating value in the job market is and which working environment fits you best. If you'd like to stay in touch with us and receive monthly updates, please subscribe to the newsletter. So, um, can you maybe explain uh, to our viewers uh, a little bit more about Game3? So, um, what uh, what kind of uh, users uh, do you attract, and like what what are, what are the main uh, features yeah. of the platform? So essentially, um, the way that the whole niche works for finding friends through gaming is it's basically just based on like selecting a single game and your demographics. Whereas like all of us, there's actually way more that determines if somebody's going to be a friend. So we look at not just um, a game in common, but like the number and proportion of games you play in common to know that you'll actually play a lot of games with somebody over time and have inter similar interests. Uh, we don't just look at the personality psychology, but also your personal values. We made a gamer DNA model that measures different kinds of fun. So for example, competitive and casual gamers don't really get along well together. So we just kept going deeper and deeper, adding different things. On a personality psychology level, um, and even just the other stuff, we have data on millions of connections that we've made between people. So we know if people became friends in Facebook after meeting in Game Tree or on Steam, if they're playing in game sessions together, they coordinate through the app, if they're like just AI analysis with their chats to know if they're getting along. So we have crazy amounts of data on who gets along with who. And it plays into kind of a natural interest with uh, psychology a lot, which is what uh, Natalia and I together. Right? Did you ever? Did you already get any couples marrying? <laughs> oh God, yeah. So we actually added a dating filter because a third of the people are using it as a dating app. 
and the algorithms of dating are a little bit different. So it also is like annoying, especially to women, you know, getting hit on all the time when they're just there her friends. So we added a filter for dating. So now you can um, pick which one. So about a third of the users are also doing that. And actually my half brother's wife's sister, the first week met somebody that became her boyfriend. And we've also, and I hadn't even met her before, but that was kind of cool to find out. Um, and then also we just got a lot of feedback where people are saying like, oh, I like, thank you for giving me the life I always wanted. I was like sad and depressed and now I have friends and a partner and like, I never thought my life would be this good. Like, thank you. Like we've literally gotten stuff like this. So it's very, very fulfilling to work on this because the value proposition of helping somebody find like a partner or friends or connection mm -hmm. is really high compared to some things like if you're manufacturing like yet another toothbrush or something. Yeah, that's actually also my, my recent realization that actually the best dating apps are not dating apps. <laughs> like I, at some point, I, mm. uh, I recently I started getting a lot of messages via LinkedIn and they were like really weird because the conversation was going uh, in an unexpected way. So first it was about work, but after like 10 or 15 minutes, I was starting getting really like awkward questions like, do you have a sister? Like, are you close with your parents? I was like, what is this? And then I realized, yeah, like people treat LinkedIn as a dating app because it's like, it's mm. safe because you can, you know, if you get like no interest, you can always tell yourself, oh, well, it was just a business chat, you know? And yeah. And you also have connection to all of their professional yeah. connections. So if they ever screw you, you can like bad mouth them. Yeah. So you always like, it's a win-win because like in the worst case, like you extend your net business network anyways. And you, you, get, you always have an excuse why it didn't work. So you never really feel rejected. You're like, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it just stayed on this like safe level. So people actually feel safer there. So I, I'm like, now when I think about it, um, and, uh, and also people have no time. Like they, people are so busy that if they can do two things at a time, they can do like grow their professional network and side hustle. <laughs> at the same I mean, time. so many people used to meet through work it's becoming less now because it's so taboo and remote working and stuff. But like, I think that was the main way people met for at some point. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I think the dating apps also purposely kind of don't try that hard yeah. because they lose money when they help people. So like game tree, at least like people can have multiple friends and also it's a public benefit corporation. So I'm more interested in just helping people, but um, the right. big dating apps, like kind of get big by doing a bad job on purpose or at least not trying too hard. Yeah, I, I, I'm not the type of gamer, but now I got interest. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, can you tell uh, tell us a bit more about like what types of games? So, is it more like video games, like metaverse type of games? Like what kind? So of games? it works for hundreds of thousands of games. Um, right now, it's not blockchain games, though. Eventually, we'll add that. Uh, but it's just um, more like for mainstream gamers. Um, the main thing is computer and console games, but we also have some mobile on there or maybe all the mobile. Right. And um, the idea is that at least for me, like I built most of my relationships growing up through gaming, you know, like not just gaming, but play in general. It could even be board games or whatever. That's like even like animals play with other animals and humans and stuff. And so I'm like, oh, well, you know, you have, you can see like how somebody behaves under pressure, like what they're like when they're lying, like how they think, and it, you kind of accelerate a, a relationship. And it's also like something to do besides just like talking and drinking alcohol. Uh, so like, it's actually, I think like a really great way to meet people. So I kind of think of it as more like a friend finding app, like disguised as a gamer app, um, as opposed to how I originally, originally started it was more like, oh, I want people to play a specific game with that I also would be friends with, but it turns out more people are just like, oh, I just want cool people to hang out with. And like, I'm flexible on what I play. And I'm like, huh, interesting. Actually, funny that you're saying, uh, actually, uh, recently a friend told me, you know, if you want to test someone, you have to uh, borrow the money and uh, go travel with them. And I think like going on a quest- And maybe live with them. Yeah, like gaming, but going on a quest with them, like in a game, I think it's a bit like travel because as you say, like it's testing them. Yeah. You see if they're planning, if they can cooperate, be patient. Um, yeah. Like how organized they are, all that, how yeah. they are when they're frustrated. 
Maybe that will be the next level corporate, uh, you know, integration thing. I know there's some research being done here uh, and totally. Uh, one of my dreams would be to design games, but I feel like I have more to offer through helping people discover people and games and personalize things and creating yet more games. But it's a kind of a secret dream to get into that space of using like, it's almost like simulation. Um, right. but, like where this reality is almost like a simulation. And when we're creating games, we're just creating more consciousness. Existences. This is actually very, very interesting. So, so you're not a game designer. You, you are a matchmaker, basically. Yeah. So actually, I have to, I have to contact you with a great team from Amsterdam. They are trying to build a platform for um, teams matching, but like teams that invest together, and and basically the idea is that you match with the teams that kind of have the same. Uh, mentality behind investing i think it's a i mean it's it's a different um, area but I, I kind of have the same flavor of, to me because it's also it makes about, sense yeah connecting yeah it's deeper yeah the way i see it is that the world is getting bigger and bigger and noisier like we had the industrial revolution where we created tons of stuff and then we had the information age where we created tons of information and now i think that the biggest next stage is about personalizing and curating all the stuff and information where we're just like overloaded with options and i think we can get like a big explosion like a multiplication and like humanity if we're better at like you know being able to get in touch with like creators that are like that we uniquely like who might not be the most popular or finding like teammates or friends or partners who are like really good for us instead of having to waste time going on like hundreds of dates and all the money and heartache and everything involved in that I mean, it's, it, there is a certain element of kind of magic to it, but there's also things that are just more likely, like certain kinds of people that statistically get together more often. So, you know, would you rather just play randomly or would you rather like pay a little bit to like increase your odds, um, which I think is like a lot of where the world is going. But at the same time, big corporations are very untrustworthy because they have a legal requirement to maximize profit for their investors, which is often requires behaving morally and screwing us with our data even if that means like not even helping us with the value proposition that they're promising so uh i think it's going to be that's why i think part of this is slower happening than it should be is the big corporations are so big but they don't actually want to help people because usually it's more profitable to not help people and have continuous problems or people don't trust them with the data needed to actually do a good job curating uh so i think that there's kind of a new generation of companies kind of like maybe the one you just mentioned uh, that are solving this problem for people. Yeah. Uh, well, um, actually, uh, I recently had a conversation with a leader of the local Web3 community in Amsterdam, Sharon Skiamas, and actually he had so, he said something really uh, wise, I think, that uh, in the old, old times, uh, the um, leaders were the decision makers, and now we enter this like Web3, like this centralized mm -hmm. world, uh, which is, as you say, uh, like overloaded with information. And in this new uh, reality, uh, we have leaders who are sense makers rather than decision makers. So we will Do have- you say sense, sense makers? Sense makers, yeah. So the idea is that like we slowly, um, like the society is slowly turning into a, a superposition of multiple tribes and DAOs like, that are quite like equal, like flat in structure. Uh, and um, and there is indeed overflow of information, and uh, there will be like the the new leaders are people who are influencers who are who have a large following and who try to make sense out of the world and basically curate this this like yeah it's shape. like soft power rather than hard power yeah um, hmm. so I, the, so I always like tell people who my coach like career wise I'm like you have to make a decision like. Uh, like what type of career you want? Do you, do you want to be an influencer, like a sense maker, or do you want to be a DAO contributor? Because uh, this is just one of two attractors uh, to like, you have to choose in 20 years, you will be one or the other and mm. uh, you have to think about it. So uh, yeah, it's just, just a little yeah. regression. I'm but very excited for Web3. And if anybody doesn't know as much about what it is, it's like kind of like how podcasts are is you upload it to one place and then, all the stores and everything pull the information from a centrally controlled area that you control. Um, but I think that you still kind of like, yeah, so it's sort of like, um, like you own your data. And then for example, like if you post something, you would like kind of lend it to Twitter or Facebook or Google rather than posting it directly onto Facebook in those places. 
Yeah. Uh, so everything is kind of more centrally controlled by you. And then other applications and ecosystems can be built around like just kind of standardized data formats. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's exciting. Although I, I have to say that as a content creator, I'm also a little bit uh, afraid of what's going to happen because now all the, um, like if you're uh, like a small content creator, then now it's like since we have the centralization, like there's just Google dominated the, you know, the or, like organic search space, let's say, and you want yeah. to optimize for Google, uh, Google, like SEO, then, then you're kind of covered. But then uh, what will happen in Web3 when we have well, 2,000? I think it's way better, personally, as a small content creator, because the thing is, most of the content is monopolized by people who have been around for a long time, have lots of backlinks, have put tons of work into SEO over time that like most people just can't afford to compete with, or like if it's a big reputable website, um, they have big existing followings. So by having it centrally controlled, like, yeah, maybe some platforms like prefer established people, but maybe some curate in different ways. So at least there's more, like maybe you might be visible on one or two platforms instead of no platforms. Uh -huh. um, so I think like anything that kind of like flattens the bell curve mm -hmm. um, is kind of good. Actually, it's or not like um, flattens the bell curve, but it's more like everything is going to the top increasingly because without good curation and personalization, it's just whoever is average the best becomes more and more popular. And there's only so much limited space for like people to know about somebody or talk about somebody to be famous, to have so many top spots on the top of Google yeah. Uh, to get recommended by these kind of snowball algorithms that just make the, mo the most successful even more successful and leave everybody else behind. So anything that kind of like redistributes to wealth, I guess, into a bell curve is um, yeah, I think generally good. Yeah, yeah. And it's also like the, the like law of nature, right? That you have this like small world distribution of like connections, like in the natural like bio, um, like. Mm, yeah. Bio in a way, Web3 is more natural. Because yeah. yeah, in reality, there's usually not one force that's like or like animal or like something that's controlling everything. Yeah, but it's also that it's a uh, like even when the society is just left alone in like in Web three, it there will still be hubs because it's just not going to f flat out into. Oh like, yeah, no. Group, but there will be hubs, and uh, there there should be this like um um how is it called um like a curve or yeah, 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 the, logarithm. Yeah, um the um. I, I forgot the name, but there's a mathematical oh. name for it. It's a, uh, yeah, um, I'll find it later. Well, I, I think it's great because, you know, some like hubs that display the data might charge too much money or give too much favoritism to the big players. And so different people can kind of like, I think it just creates a lot better competition and more choices for the consumers and more fairness. Uh, right now, we've it's been a while since our last like serious recession. So the companies have gotten pretty inefficient, you know, not like where there's just so much money mm -hmm. that uh, they kind of just become sort of negligent and they're keeping other companies from being able to exist. But um, hopefully alongside Web3, a recession together um, could really, you know, create a lot of opportunity and a lot of value creation. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm positive. I'm just, uh, um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I hope for the best, but I prepare for the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, tell, tell us, please, a, a, a little bit about your recent project, uh, 512 Personalities, right? Yeah, so um, it's based on a framework. Basically, it's like, I, it might be the first, like, test developed with scientific method in the personality sphere. Um, there's a lot of value created from tons of tests in different ways. Like, you can compare people to test takers that have certain jobs um, and how happy they are, or you can compare people like cluster samples where you see like what's related to each other and kind of label those cluster samples to kind of like categorize people. Um, but none of them are actually using scientific method in that um, they're reproducible. They're not just based on self-reporting. Uh, and it's based on this framework called the objective personality system um, that was developed by some other people, but I basically developed the first test for, and it's been like hundreds of hours, way harder than I thought it would be to actually create questions that people consistently answer accurately about their own psychology. Uh, because, you know, we're all like, almost like purposely programmed to not see ourselves very well, to like help us feel more confident and secure and stuff. And we're sort of biased to like, see the way we see the world is like the right or the only way. Um, but in the psychology, like kind of as people develop, we get better at using different parts of our psychology and become more balanced and less like one dimensional where we kind of think like, oh, like I'm good at this and therefore like that's the criteria I use to evaluate everything. 
life is complicated and everybody's ways of thinking is different is valid in different situations mm -hmm. so a lot of it's about um like understanding where are you biased and also appreciating people for the different strengths instead of kind of thinking they're like incorrect or incompetent or wrong or bad so when it comes to the test essentially uh the main researchers have independently analyzed like thousands and thousands of people over many years uh, and they've been developing this sort of model about what's objectively trackable in the real world, not according to self-reporting, but like they'll watch like people talking about themselves or interviews with lots of footage. And essentially they'll independently say like, okay, is this person more this or this, this or this? And they just have a bunch of like AB coins. Mm -hmm. And if they can consistently track something like a lot independently over time, then that's something that's trackable in the real world. And if it's not, they just throw it away. So it's kind of just like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what stays. And over the course of many years, they've actually developed a system of things that are like starting to intertwine and find tons of crazy correlations and become more and more observable and predictable uh, to the point where when you start to look at these people at scale, a lot of people with the same psychologies tend to actually even look like siblings and twins. So there's something going on on the genetic level that they've basically tapped into. And people are different because culture influences us, but what this is testing is more like primarily genetic stuff. And even still, there's a lot of variance between people because of like cultures or levels of maturity and stuff like that. Um, it's not everybody's the same, but you get basically an order of operations of what are ways that you're better at like taking in information, understanding it, or responding to and making decisions with information. It's the same thing as computer programming. You have a function with an input and an output, and we're kind of like functions. And there's different ways of taking and responding to information. So based on like what is easier for you, what are you better at, what takes less energy, we kind of are lazy and we follow a flow of to conserve energy. And so with the psychology that this 512 types test measures is like, what are your biases? Like what are your kind of strengths and weaknesses? And usually your biggest strength is also your biggest weakness because you're over relying on it or not seeing the other half of reality that's associated with that. For example, like, if you're somebody who's very tribal um, and you care a lot about fairness and consensus and what do experts think or what's the average, and then like you're kind of maybe not listening to yourself enough, or if you're listening to yourself too much, you're not like you're, you might be totally wrong. And there's a reason that there's an average or the tribe's opinion and stuff like that, um, and that you might just be like totally off on your own. Uh, so like you could be really good at one of those things, but if you're like too good at it, you're by definition not balancing it with the other where the best people are actually the ones balancing like what are my thoughts and what what is like the common sense logic or like the kind of more group thought. Uh, so that's like one example. So the 712 types test is currently at about 79% accuracy at guessing like AB coins uh, based on people, only counting people's data who have been typed by the main experts. So in this current iteration, it's the fourth generation, there's 86 at this point in time, uh, but that's going up more and more. And then anybody can take it and then using that as training data actually get kind of like pretty objectively accurate information about their psychologies. And throughout the iterations of the test, we've been actually A-B testing, like, how do you ask the question? How do you answer the question? How many choices can you give? And it's never made sense in a personality test ever throughout history to actually A-B test like this because people are self-reporting and you're not uh, like comparing to an objective external criteria. But now we actually have like, what is that person's actual psychology and how are they answering the question? So it actually makes sense to A-B test. We've learned a lot. Uh, for example, we have like a six point scale because it turned out that having like um, a like, like 10 point scale or a six point scale is actually just as accurate as having one with a middle option. And according to like different tests that we ran, but if you have a middle option, it's not really giving you useful data. So at least by having an even number, you're, at, you're getting more data points and not losing accuracy. So that's kind of cool that we actually discovered that in the psychology test. Um, yeah, I'll leave, leave it there. That uh, 512types.com is a website where I am hosting the, the test. Right now it's still like the AP Scrappy version, um, but we'll be adding more information on kind of like 16personalities.com, but just a deeper, more accurate version. Okay, and uh, does uh, 512 uh, has, has a, have a meaning? Because it's a power of two, right? Uh... Correct, yeah, yeah. So there's actually 1,024 types if you count gender, um, because like something, a weird pattern that are showing up is like there's a certain type, for example, of um, men that if they're a certain type, like it's more than 50% chance that they're gay. And I know like a few people who are gay who are this type. And the first one that I typed, it was actually before I knew that they're likely gay. So it wasn't like a bias thing. Uh, but then if you're a woman and you're that type, like you're like very unlikely to be gay. 
Um, so there's kind of, it's interesting that like it's showing up differently across genders, but it kind of makes sense just given that there's like some psychological differences, but ultimately it's just one dimension out of many. Uh, so an example could be like, are you more of an organizer or a gatherer? Uh, and you could be different degrees of them, but people that are organizers tend to uh, look inside their known information before gathering first. They maybe will review notes or organize notes a little bit better. They'll use things that worked for them in the past. Uh, they tend to like in a conversation go back to like an unfinished point uh, before continuing on. They kind of want to have a better plan or be prepared for things in the future. Whereas like gatherers, and you, I'm sure you recognize these in yourself or other people that you know are a little more like tactical. They can like handle problems as they arrive. They're more uncomfortable. They're more comfortable with ambiguity. They'll, they tend to like gather new information a lot before looking to old information. Mm -hmm. um, they're constantly wanting like what's the new way or the best way, and they want to like try a ton of different things. And they're like less committed to something. Uh, they might be updating their goals more as they go um, based on like things that come up rather than like sticking to like one long term strategy. Uh, so people have like observable objective biases towards these different things, and ourselves just thinking what we are is often inaccurate, but this tests through lots of generations of, um, of swapping out and changing in different questions. Like probably only like 15% of our original questions are even in the test right now that we thought were testing different aspects of this. Um, but we finally just kept the coins that like the ABs uh, where we have high correlations between how people answer and what is their actual psychology. And it's not perfectly accurate and we never will because people will never self-report that accurately. Um, but I was expecting like a 65% accuracy to be um, happy with the results. And we're at 79 right now. And it's only gonna get more accurate with deeper analysis factoring in for like gender, culture, age, things like that. Um, and also bigger sample sizes. And yeah, so that's basically the background on the test. Yeah, that's amazing. 79, so given psychometric data is a very good number. I, I worked It's way higher than I thought. Like, I was like, we're very, very, very surprised. Yeah, getting um, anything over the chance level, yeah, it, especially if you have that dimensionality in the model, it's really amazing. So congratulations. And uh, so I, I part have... of the reason for going with a six point model instead of a two point model is uh, it turns out that people who answer on the extremes are actually very high, highly correlated. So in between, like people might be wrong a lot more, but if you ask a question like, I'm highly nurturing and I have a problem with like taking care of other people too much before myself, like people can answer all over the place and they can just have their own opinions about their, themselves and not know like what is objective reality on a spectrum of people. But when people answer on the extremes, like usually they're actually accurate. Like if somebody's like, yes, that is totally me. Like I have a big problem with that or like, fuck no, like, like I don't have that problem. Like um, that's very accurate. And right now, because our training data sample size is 86 participants, we're actually not counting the extremes, but I expect our accuracy to go up quite a lot. Like in the, our uh, previous samples when we were testing it, um, that we're not currently giving results on that, but I expect it to go up based on those uh, factoring and those extreme answers. Right. You know, I, I have my own uh, like tendency to uh, think about the job market straight away because of a career advisory thing. Oh, I took but your test and loved it, like Donna and I, yeah. Turning. The wheels are turning now and I'm like, yeah, how to use this for like how to help people in the job market? Because like, I can imagine that some of these profiles are more like, um, you know, uh, leads to a higher success chance in certain types yeah. of so the, the way I see it is that people are kind of like ants and bees and termites so far as we have division of labor. Uh, like in economics, division of labor is basically proven to be more productive. And because we're a hyper social species that has advanced communication, we're able to have division of labor without having it like, like quite as hardwired into us as ants and stuff. But it actually is hardwired into us that people don't even realize. Like, we actually do fit into like genetic archetypes. It's not just like random distribution of like just random stuff. Like there's actually real archetypes that are going on for different kinds of roles or activities that people in a tribe naturally enjoy doing more or easier for them. And because it's something better for them, they naturally do it more and then they specialize. So for example, like gatherers are better hunters, like straight up, like it's just a fact. Like if you look at like professional athletes, like you're going to find in most sports, depending on the sport, but like most of the time it's like lead, like people that are extreme on the gathering end. Um, and especially there's like um, kind of more abstract and concrete gatherers. Concrete gatherers are more like, like sensual, tactical in the moment, usually better at like wrapping or like physical things. 
whereas the abstract ones are more like creative and intellectual, like witty, things like that. Um, and the, especially the physical gatherers, like it's showing up like very, very much. So without even knowing what somebody looks like or what their job is or anything, like there's just massive correlations between people being successful in professional sports and having this high, like sensory extroverted gathering, like high up in their psychology. And if you look at their bodies, like naturally, they actually have like naturally physically stronger, bigger bodies as well, um, just on like a genetic level. So if I'm one of these gatherers, and I'm like out hunting, for example, like I'm going to consistently bring home food. And uh, Natalia, if you're like, let's say good at like constructing houses, you're going to build things that like don't fall on us and kill us. But if everybody's average, then like, I'm not going to consistently get food. You're not going to consistently like build things that don't collapse on us. And like, it's actually worse for everybody. Some of the personality types actually are better generalists and that's part of their archetype. But overall, like it's actually what we're finding is that um, we very much evolved to have genetic differences. And I think as it relates to jobs, there's definitely correlations because the jobs are basically like roles in a tribe. So if certain people have natural dispositions to enjoy certain activities more or for them to be like take less energy to think in a certain way. And knowing that about yourself and being able to correlate that to which jobs do that, um, I think could be like very, very powerful in helping predict like which jobs would you enjoy and be good at and also who should you hire. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and I think, uh, and uh, actually, I'm curious, like, what personality type are you? Did you test yourself? Or um, so this is all based on the original Carl Jung, like, 16 type Myers-Briggs stuff. Um, but it's been a lot more developed and had scientific method applied to it for the first time. Those things are very useful frameworks, I think, and they're interesting, and they're kind of tapping at reality. Um, but this is just a more, like, basically modern and uh, evolved version of it. Uh, in 16 personality tests, I always get ENTJ. Um, by the way, what do you get? Uh, I uh, I think INTJ. Okay, that's what I was expecting to yeah. probably show up in these tests. Oh. Um, uh, but when I, in this more objective personality type, when you get more options and subtypes, I'm actually an ISTP, which is in some ways similar, but overall like pretty different, like ENTJ and ISTP, each of those letters being a different kind of dimension. Um, but what they're really standing for, it's a code to read somebody's cognitive functions, like ways that you think respond to information and perceive information and the order of preferences that you do those things. Um, but because there's the 512 types, um, there's more nuance. So in the 512 types, my sort of like bias, like baby blanket is introverted thinking. It's like personal logic. Um, so it's often associated with just being good at like calculations, logic, math, um, things like that. Uh, so people with this tend to be like engineers, for example. Uh, and then its opposite is extroverted feeling, which is more like group emotions. And so that's kind of a point in my psychology where because that's the thing I'm doing less of because I'm choosing to do introverted logic instead of group emotions to solve projects, it's like an insecurity spot for me. So in order to get balance, I try to get like <clears throat> approval from like the group's emotions and feelings and fit into a tribe and stuff through overdoing personal logic. And so that creates a specialist, but at the same time, usually the best way to get to the thing you're trying to get to is by just actually doing that thing. So that's why a lot of the most developed and mature people are more balanced because they're actually not overdoing their logic all the time. They realize like, oh, like if I want acceptance from the tribe, I just need to like hug people and share memes and like, and like do stuff like that, you know, like more. And that's actually gets the results. But instead we're kind of programmed to like not do that because it makes us more productive specialists. Uh, the best are people who can like do their specialty when it's needed, but not always be dependent on it. Uh, the next last like part of like kind of the main on the 16 personality level is uh, that kind of athletic version, um, the sort of gathering data. So it's uh, sensory data, tactical awareness, um, things like that. And then this has uh, more dimensions that aren't, don't exist. Uh, one is that you can actually have two extroverted or introverted functions in a row before they flip to other ones in the 16 system. like they have to kind of like go like take turns. And I don't ever know, like I've never seen a good reason for why that is. And I've always kind of suspected it in this new framework. It's kind of proven that it's observable that some people actually are gatherers and like, for example, they're more tribal, which is an extroverted decision function. Uh, and then that leads into these things called, um, they call them animals, but I'm referring to them as behaviors or energies and um, our own test because I think it's a better term that's been approved by the community where different people have different behaviors using these functions, different combinations. So if you have these two extroverted functions, it creates a play energy where you're like 
gathering in real time, like with the tribe. So it's kind of like um, being like more interactive, not being afraid to ask for help, being creative with people, like uh, stuff like that. Where it's opposite, which is looking to yourself for information, looking to yourself for answers, that's like sleep energy or like a sleep behavior. So some people have a preference for a sleep behavior over a play behavior. And even though you have certain functions, you might have different behaviors. And there's four different combinations. There's also consuming and blasting, which is outside in, inside out, like outside, and there's also inside. And different people have different behavior patterns. So somebody might have the same primary tools that they go to, but then they might like, you know, spin off into like being more introverted or extroverted in different ways. The last bit is masculine and feminine functions. Like each of these functions has a masculine or feminine tint, uh, apparently. And it's not necessarily related to gender. Whatever you don't extrovert, you introvert. Or whatever you have masculine one, you have feminine in the opposite. So for example, um, masculine tends to be more like stable, less movable. Whereas feminine is more like open, more easy, more movable. So an example in myself is I have masculine introverted logic. Uh, so that means that like I'm very hard by like my logic and what I think and I kind of trust my own thoughts a lot and I can like push with my logic. But when it comes to the tribe and the feminine part of emotions and stuff like that, the extroverted feeling, that part's feminine in me. So I'm not like super diehard about like what my tastes are and what I like and how I'm feeling or like controlling how other people are feeling and stuff like that. I'm a lot more movable in that area. Uh, so everybody has kind of their own different versions of these things that show up. Well, that's super interesting. I didn't think about it this way um, ever. Like, I wonder if it's not a... in any of the other frameworks that I've ever seen. Yeah, I've never seen that. Uh, like, um, like gender component to a personality model. Yeah, it, it's not. It's masculine and feminine, but it's not necessarily gender related. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's certain ones that extrovert a little bit more, which is apparently, and it's not symmetrical, which is strange because most things turn out symmetrical in a framework, uh, like ideally, but. Uh, one is like your sensory can be masculine and that kind of comes out more extrovertedly um, or if your tribe function is more um, extroverted, but the tribe function could be like thinking or feeling as opposed to sensing or intuition. And they're kind of like different um, directions according to like how this framework works. But if you're like masculine tribe, it means that you kind of like move the tribe, but it also means that your inner world and your identity is feminine. So it's actually the case that they're controlling the tribe because they need to protect their inner world. So they're controlling and hard on the outside world because they're movable inside. Um, so an example is if somebody is masking with the tribe, that means that they'll push and control the outer world because their inner world is feminine. Uh, but whereas if somebody is actually very feminine with the tribe, it's because they have a masculine inner world where they feel more comfortable being moved around on the outside because their identity is solid and isn't going to change. So everybody has this sort of yin and yang balance. And that's showing up like observably, reproducibly by multiple external people, not just like one per external person's opinion. But if like you and I both know the psychology really well, you and I could both observe somebody and like with about 95% accuracy, the best people like consistently come up with like the same observations about somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually that, that might explain why some people are, you know, like uh, bulldogs at work, but when it comes, they come home and they are puppy dogs all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally handy. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because like we all have the masculine and the feminine, it's just what appears more like extrovertedly in the outer world. Right, interesting. And actually something that really like drew my attention when I was, so I took the questions via type form that you shared with me and okay. I was quite uh, surprised with the questions because Given that this is a kind of a reboot of the uh, 16 personalities test, like the questions were very different. So the classic 16 personalities are these like Likert scale questions. Oh, that yeah. are, say quite mono, I wouldn't say boring. I would say hmm, just, uh, yeah, I would say nothing surprising, just the statements about yourself and you have to so ask. Like, are you more organized or not organized? Just yeah, like... there's <laughs> kind of questions that you need three coffees to go through the, through the questionnaire because it's just uh, so monotonous. Um, yeah, and for years I've been saving questions and I've been typing people just on my own, like, you know, like so, so many people. And I find that there's certain, like, it takes a while because you can't just trust what somebody says. And you yeah. can't just trust up one data point. You have to look for a pattern across data points and withhold judgment and not be biased to like yeah. be, try to be accurate when you're typing people. And um, there's, I, I just share a lot of the questions that I personally have found over time just by trying to probe and poke and find out eventually and then see like what the pattern is like what is observable and sometimes even now with this test a lot of the things that i thought i was observing um actually turn out to be like very different than what i thought they were testing as well yeah i was i was surprised so uh yeah the first question i remember i had to uh 
yeah, try to count 30 seconds on my mind. I was like, oh, yeah. oh, this is a good attention grabber. What comes next, right? And then, uh, and then there were questions like, what are you afraid more of? And then two, two, uh, two answers and oh, yeah. I was like. And we're, we're actually even, quest I don't know if you saw the newest five version. I don't remember if I sent it to you, but we actually added questions about like, are you an early bird or a night owl compared to people your age? Um, how many hours per night do you sleep? Like stuff like that. Um, and so like, and like, do you need a nap in the afternoon? So like part of them, those ones weren't in prior, prior tests, so we'll remove them from the type form uh, if they're not turning out to have good correlations. But it is interesting stuff because that's a lot more like a hard measurable thing that's more objective. Mm -hmm. uh, so as an example, um, let's say amount of sleep. Um, it turns out that the amount you sleep is especially correlated. Interesting. I haven't actually like dug into these much because we just finally released the version with test results. Uh, but apparently it's very correlated with um, whether you're more emotional or logical. Um, hmm. oh. Well, my guess is going to be that more emotional people sleep more. But I'm not positive. Um, but yeah, that's actually a pretty high correlation. Um, I, I don't have any guess, honestly, on that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like I, 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 I never really digged into that part of... Uh, like psychology literature, <laughs> so. Mm. There's also, let's see. Um, well, there's an everlasting debate who is more intelligent, right? Morning larks yeah. or oh. night owls and that's They're it. also, w w between who? Yeah, there's like this everlasting debate uh, in psychology literature, who is more intelligent, uh, night owls or uh, morning larks. Oh, interesting. Because it depends, like the results always depend on who does the study. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's so many kinds of intelligence too. Uh, <laughs> apparently there's also high correlations with whether somebody has higher sleep or play behavior, where I'm sure that sleep, high sleep behavior, people that look to themselves for information answers sleep more than um, people who are like going outside for that. And also being an organizer or a gatherer, which is partly correlated to that. Um, but I'm pretty sure I looked at it before and I did see organizers sleep more. So people that are more like, able to do routine and things like that um, are people who sleep more. Right. Yeah, interesting. And so maybe it's safer for them to sleep more because they're more built for society and civilization and comfort. Whereas if you're a gatherer, you probably nap more or like sleep less because it's like kind of dangerous when you're sleeping. So uh, if I may ask, uh, uh, what are the plans for this test? Is it that uh, there will be an opportunity to take a standalone test uh, soon or is it yeah, so the test is actually live right now. And when this airs, it will be hosted on 512types.com. Just the number is 512 and then types.com. And uh, right now it's like more scrappy MVP and the test is free. Um, and basically it gives you kind of, it doesn't give you like one overall type as much because it's hard to do that for 1,024 or 512 types. Um, but what it does more is look like at different AB things and say like you're more this than this or you're much stronger this than this. And so it's actually like more realistic about ways to approach somebody. When it's 16, you can kind of create 16 characters, even though that's not really how it works. It's more just like a combination of traits that somebody has. Um, it is possible to draw archetypes around it, um, especially in the future, we can kind of dynamically rewrite like a, like a single script. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of looking at like what are individual behaviors or, or even sometimes clusters of things. Like somebody, for example, who has like like play and consume behaviors, like at the top of the psychology together, consume and play, they tend to be trying things a lot and they kind of like are a little bit ADHD-ish and they kind of like sample a lot. Uh, so like that's something that kind of comes from having those two together. Um, so yeah, we'll basically share these sorts of things. And then as time goes on, have more depth about like, what does this mean in all these contexts? What does this mean for like relationships, friends, um, work, personal growth, uh, for example, where the areas because it's almost like a map where if you know your psychology like objectively like scientifically you can be like oh like i'm objectively doing this too much and i'm objectively not doing this enough if i'm trying to like meet the world on like a multifaceted the world's complicated level and requires everything so by having that knowledge it's like oh like in my case if i have too much introverted thinking if i'm thinking keyword uh oh i might you know need to like do more extroverted feeling type stuff um, in this situation, the fact that I know I'm biased to like not do that, and the fact that I'm even thinking about it means I've, it's probably already too late and I should have been doing that before. 
So knowing growth areas and what side of the fence to kind of fall towards, um, especially over time, can really help develop us into like more powerful people that can better handle different kinds of problems that life throws at us. Otherwise, what happens is we just constantly have poking and annoyance from things in life, or we neglect things and they come as giant tidal waves. And we grow through just massive, massive, like life shattering discomfort and like rock bottom things where it's like, oh, the way I'm doing things don't work and I have to be different or just constant, constant annoyance to the point where you're like fed up and you're like, okay, I'm going to have like less pain later if I just like go through more short term pain and get used to doing something a different way. By having a map, you can be more proactive about it. It kind of like level up faster and easier than having life force you to do it. Yeah, actually, uh, once you started the personality test and so like so in depth that I think you set yourself for life like, with the amount of work you have to do. So now it's never going to end, I think, because there are so oh, many. Oh, no. So I love this stuff. So many people for years have been telling me, like, you need to do psychology, you need to do psychology. And I do apply it to, um, to Game Tree, to social network. Uh, but I'm glad that this test is finally done now because it's something that the communities needed so badly and it's especially needed if this psychology is going to become more popular in scale. The main researchers are purposely not publishing it themselves because they're like anti-chaos psychology um, and they are taking their time. Um, they are economically self-sufficient. They want to have like tons of data and have less chaos later when they reveal it to the scientific community of papers and such. Um, but they're okay with like myself and others, you know, working with it and being the ones to like kind of bear that chaos for them. Okay. So if... Uh... Some of our viewers would like to, uh, let's say, get in touch with you and help you with your research, or I don't know, uh, do you do you need any pairs of hands to help, or is it like a, yeah? Um, I mean, if people are interested, you can always reach out. My email is John UK J O H N U K E at Gmail, and also on the Five Twelve website. Uh, eventually, I'll probably offer some sort of like consulting options, like if you want to have calls to like go deeper dive and ask personal questions, because a lot of the value of this beyond having generic information is being able to apply a lot more specific information. Uh, or if there's parts in your test that might be more ambiguous that because the test is right now only 79% accurate at predicting coins, um, you get like kind of verified um, by having somebody probe you or even a couple people probe you. There could be typing teams uh, where you may get like four people that kind of all analyze you who all have different backgrounds and kind of like see if they got the same results. Um, but knowing this stuff can be like extremely beneficial. Like in my own personal life, like once I got objectively analyzed by the main researchers, like after that is when I experienced like the biggest boom in personal growth in my life, when I was finally able to be more objective with myself, because some people are better at seeing themselves. My natural psychology is worse at it. So I thought I was like totally different, like in my head that I am in real life and having a lot more clarity around that just allows me to like manage myself a lot better as a person. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's like, Investing in yourself is your best investment, possibly. I, I'm, yeah. I'm saying, yeah, I also, uh, actually, when I was building uh, the test I, I created in the company, I was also testing myself with that the, the test after it was already, like, released. And I kind of got a confirmation of what I was feeling the most, which was that I'm not a specialist. I'm not, mm. uh, I was trying to be become one. And I was saying, my 15 years of education, <laughs> I was trying to put myself in the shoes of a specialist, but like I was always failing because I'm totally like, I have a different yeah. mind and I, I could never succeed to be like a specialist in a narrow discipline. And kind of, it was a hard realization at the end that it was 15 years of like, you know, trying hard for, for, and, and yeah. it was, like, meant to be that I failed, but. So little time knowing that earlier could make such a big impact on how many years could change. I guess an example, not in our personality tests, is uh, the gamer DNA test in Game Tree, where like there's different types of fun. And like I love stories, like people telling stories, books, movies, but apparently I don't like them for games. That's just not on my game DNA palette. And it's what the, like our gamer DNA model has made me realize like, oh, I should stop buying games where one of the main things that they deliver is story, like his. That's actually not why I play games. Um, I, I play games for like different reasons, uh, but it's actually saved me a lot of time and money, like trying to like play or finish these games that are very, very heavy on the story element because um, I actually prefer to consume that like through other mediums. Um, so having that kind of more objectivity has been nice, and it's kind of come kind of out likewise through like a test that we developed. Right. What is your favorite game, by the way? Oh gosh, right now it's Marvel Crisis Protocol. It's like a game where you like 
paint like Marvel models. Uh, I'm not a huge Marvel fan. I think they're kind of cool, but like the game is actually just extremely well designed. It's kind of like a tactical skirmish game. And there's also an online kind of version that you can play of it where you like are in a call with somebody and it's like it, games last a couple hours and it's a really interesting uh, dynamic of like a good balance between like simplicity and like depth. Um, so that's like overall my favorite right now. Um, but like so far as traditional games go, there's a game called Dota 2. Uh, it, it's very complicated, uh, but it's like a five versus five online game. It's also the biggest esport in the world. And I just find it to be very replayable because there's so many combinations and like each match, like you start fresh and there's so many variables and like different characters you play and how you evolve them and items you get and what happens and different combinations with other characters and counters. And like, there's just so much to it that you can like really dive deep in it. And that's something also that like my introverted thinking bias towards is it loves to have logic you can chew on and optimize and stuff. Um, so a lot of this is showing through uh, that psychology lens. How do you find time for this? I'm just like... Um, I have like a pretty good work play balance, I would say. Um, when I'm working, like I wake up early, I just like hammer it. And that's like my peak productivity is like during the daytime. And then I kind of go off into games where because I enjoy it so much, I find a lot more energy or otherwise I'd be pretty tired or burned out. Um, so that's like mostly how I do it. But since living in Ukraine, I was moving around to Europe for a few months and like sleeping in tons of different beds and having to figure out like all these things constantly. So I didn't really get to play much for a long time. Uh, but hopefully now that I'm back in California, I can start to chill out again. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, do you right. play games? Uh, not so many, actually. I'm not a big. I'm not big of a gamer, but you encouraged me today. <laughs> now I have to check out. There's also a lot of studies that show people who play some games are actually better off, like developmentally, happiness-wise, like psychologically, than people who play too much games or no games. Yeah, but that's that's a problem. I'm an addictive personality in general, I think, and mm. for me, like th it's the same with like drinking. Like it's easier for me to just stay away than drink just one. Glass. Yeah. And it's the same with gaming. When I start, like I just go. That's a very fair yeah. Start binging, and that's um, yeah. But one one game I I love more than anything is Werewolf. Like that's like it's oh, a I love that. social game, but it's like yeah. it's all about lying, lying, killing, and we. Yeah. Uh, For me, the best of tabletop games because it's harder to binge because you need other people, and even if you are binging, you're also like building people skills and relationships and stuff, and it's like like on average a little more meaningful. But if you're playing games online by yourself or playing the same game a lot, it, you get really diminishing returns. And that's a lot of what Game Tree means to me is that if you're going to be playing online, at least play with people you like or care about um, because you're also it's like hanging out with friends simultaneously. Uh, so it's a lot more like enjoyable and meaningful and yeah. useful. And some play some games are never like getting uh, boring, even if you play with the same people all the time. Like Dixit, for instance, like this card oh, game. Oh, I love that game too. Yeah, I love like it. Okay, we're gonna play some games next time we hang out and get a group together. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean Dixit is yeah, but it, was, it feels different when you play with new people and different when you play with people who you know. Yeah, who, who and every time it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Chess to me gets really repetitive, even though it seems like a good introverted logic game. There's not enough like combinations. There's kind of standard openings, and there's a lot of like stuff that's too standard. Um, and there's like the amount of complexity in chess compared to like Dota is like 0.1%. Um, so I love having that sort of like ability to have logical frameworks in a world, but also to be able to treat it like art at the same time and to use it more intuitively. Yeah, but like, I to kind of use like both. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, my my dad is a chess player. It's a, um, mm. yeah. It's a. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I feel I feel a bit like an old soul. Like I really I don't really enjoy all those uh, like, you know, mm, the the games of the new era. Like all these like visually stunning uh, games developed in. Um, yeah, I also care less about some pleasure, end. which is what we label it as, uh, yeah. and also like shooters. Like they can get boring quickly for me personally, even though they're becoming more and more popular. Uh, but that the world is huge and there are tons of good games yeah. that I'm sure that you'd enjoy. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, I even invested as an early stage investor in one metaverse project and they are building some gaming environment, they think, but I have no problem making money off of it. I just don't want to spend my time there, you know? It's just, mm, I was yeah. too away, play my board oh game. Oh my gosh, really games are gonna get so cool when we're doing it in deeper VR and like carrying items around and stuff. Yeah, I think that'll be fun. 
Yeah. Well, like yeah. people are different, as you as you say. But I think in the future there might be some uh, like second, you know, wave of interest in board games because people are. I think they're. Oh, they're actually been spiking. Like up until the recession, they were getting double digit growth for like six or seven years in America, which is like very very fast. Yeah. Um, like, like even in San Diego, the number of stores like tripled, like compared to when I grew up, um, like yeah. just here. And I feel like sometimes I feel like I just want to have detox from internet, like everything but internet. Totally. Face to face, not being in front of a screen. Yeah. Totally. I that part of the success cards, I didn't mention it in this podcast, but um, are you familiar with them? I saw them on your LinkedIn profile. Okay, so like I made these uh, these cards that basically have 101 different lenses to analyze a business through, and it has like like a unique illustration, um, like a quote from a famous expert, some like kind of digested knowledge that's like to get you creative. But the main thing is questions to ask yourself, to kind of like think and to create value for yourself, and it's meant to be very time efficient. And I forget where I was going with these cards. <laughs> totally veered. I will link um, well, them. Oh, I will link them in the. In okay. The, yeah. Um, but it, it was less about a plug, but I had a point about them. Um, what was it, what were we just talking about right before? Uh, board games. Board games. So the the thing is, these could exist in a digital format, but like a lot of it's about actually having something physical and having the space to think. Because when you're on a computer, there's like people texting you and distractions, and doesn't mean as much. And people actually remember information worse if it's on a screen. Uh, so I kind of made them actually as a physical product, which is very different from background in like psychology and technology. Um, so yeah, these cards are like purposely meant to like get you away from technology as like an excuse. Cause I see that being a trend and also yeah. having to compete with like things that are just like demanding attention and offering tons of dopamine the more and more. I actually even have this concept like in the future, I I'm planning to uh, buy a cottage house somewhere in the countryside and I will paint, I will, by myself, I will paint uh, some of the rooms with a special paint. So you can create a Faraday cage in a room if you, if you paint it with, uh, with like special paint. So there is no mm. electromagnetic field inside, like nothing. So wow. you, you cannot even use your phone. Nothing, nothing gets through. So Interesting. I never yeah. heard about that. Yeah, yeah. It's like a like phys- simple concept from physics, like physic, physics 101. But it's like no one knows about it for some reason. I mean, Google will never mm-hmm. show it to you if you Google it. So, wow. <laughs> for some reason, uh, so uh, yeah. But it's really simple to do. You can even like you can find so many tutorials on YouTube. It's just a matter of buying the right paint and very simple setup, and you can be completely free from all the like electromagnetic activity. You just walk in and there's complete silence. You cannot even wow. uh, listen to the radio. That's Maybe perfect. having a bedroom or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, like I would just, uh, I would do it in the dining room. Like nobody, nobody looks at their right. phone. Like in the dining room. I like that. Yeah, especially with kids. <laughs> like you don't even have to monitor them anymore. Or time out, they go into the painted room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you so much, John, for joining us today and telling us about, uh, about Game Tree and about uh, 512 personalities <laughs> and so i'll link everything down below guys uh, you please check it out and follow john on linkedin and Great. other social media thank you so much john for your time it's been a pleasure bye okay cool